you saw the very best players the entire country has to offer, and you saw it throughout the course of the weekend. He's growing, he's improving at such a rapid rate. He, he's going to be a very good player. This guy's a cross between Sean Marion and Lamar Odom. He's a six foot eight lefty, a high level athlete, but also got a little bit of point forward skills in him as he can handle and pass the ball extremely well. At this point, they are simply the standard by which everyone else is judged in prep school basketball. He's considering the likes of Michigan, North Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas. Welcome back to the Upside Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Finkelstein, and this week's episode is a little unique. We're calling it the offer episode here on the Upside Podcast as I have Bryant head coach Jared Grasso joining me on the podcast to talk about uh, his unique recruiting philosophy. Uh, coach, thanks for joining us. Adam, appreciate you having me, buddy. All right. So first of all, a little disclaimer, as, as uh, many people probably know, Jared and I are friends. We worked together at the University of Hartford, um, geez, over 15 years ago now. I was at his wedding. He was at my wedding. I'm never going to call him coach again on this podcast, but it's uh, so if this has a little bit more of a playful tone, there's that's just because it's uh, more authentic. Um, but in all seriousness, what the hell are you doing, man? I mean, um, you've uh, so because people know you and I have have a friendship. I often get texts, you know, like what are what are they uh, what are they doing? Who did they just offer? So, in in all seriousness, you've been the head coach going into your third season now. I do not have the exact statistics, but you, I'm gonna guess, have offered somewhere around 500 scholarships. Is that a fair estimate? Probably in that ballpark. Okay. So to repeat, what the hell are you doing? Well, let me start and go into a little bit of my background. Um, I kind of have three mentors in in the business. Uh, my father, who was a longtime high school coach, coached at the college level. Uh, a gentleman named Brian Carey, longtime high school coach on Long Island. And Tim Clues, my former boss, who longtime high school coach, then coached at the college level. Um, obviously, and you know the success he had. So I've been around three people who were very outside the box thinkers and not really caught up in this is the way you're supposed to do it. The mm -hmm. cookie marketer mode of everyone in college does it the same way. You go out there in the July recruiting period, you go out in September, you follow these guys, you recruit them for nine months, you're in a list of five, five official visits. I just don't necessarily believe that's the right way. And that is not the way I've done it, obviously. Um, right. To start off with the first piece, if you just look at it mathematically, Let's mm -hmm. just take all my opinions and all those things out, my gut feelings and the way I want to do things. There's five BCS conferences plus the Big East, the American, and the Atlantic 10, which are all the highest, probably the eight highest ranked conferences in the country. You're talking about 100 schools, 13 scholarship players. That's 1,300 players in those programs. Mm -hmm. Three, roughly 325 players in each class if you were to balance each class out evenly. So there I've are done the same. Did, we've done the same calculations from a recruiting standpoint, because when people say to me, is he a high major guy? I usually say, is he a top 300 player in the class? And that's usually because supply and demand to your to your point is, is going to usually dictate the level. But just quick sidebar there. So not to cut you off. Go ahead. So for that reason alone, when people look at the numbers, you could say, oh, wow, that's a lot of offers. Well, why should I only offer five guys if there's 300 players in the country that are good enough to play in conferences that are ranked significantly higher than ours? Mm -hmm. So if I can get one of those guys, could be a program changer. So mm -hmm. right there, you're making a decision that you're offering a scholarship to someone that they do decide they want to come to Bryant, get a great education, be a part of a, a program that's on the rise. Now you have a possible program changer. Second piece, and, and the one that I've kind of authentically and I've seen the results of, and I've done it now. It started when I was at Fordham, did it when I was at Iona and, and now being here, there's something to be said about being someone's first scholarship offer. Mm -hmm. I have six guys on my roster right now who I was their first scholarship offer. Gio Fontan, Chris Gaston, which are names from, you know, 12, 14 years ago, I was their first scholarship offer when they were playing at Fordham, ended up uh, playing at, St. Anthony's in Jersey City ended up coming to play for me at Fordham, uh, myself and, and Derek Wittenberg, and both were very successful players who had great careers. Got in early, got them done early. And if you can get a commitment from one of those guys you offer as a sophomore or a junior, you now have two or three years to help them mold their habits 
So they're prepared to play immediately when they step on campus. Mm -hmm. Where if a kid commits to you in, in July of his postgraduate year, some guys don't have the habits that they're ready to play and be ready to play immediately. And unfortunately, in the culture of instant gratification, if guys aren't playing early on, they're going to be one of those 1,017 guys in the transfer portal. So I think if you offer a guy early who you like and you're able to get them committed very early on, then you have two or three years to mold them. And a lot of those times it's a kid, like some will see a, an offer for a 2022 kid that I know is class, reclassifying to 2023 or a kid I know is doing a post-grad year or a kid I know is going to go to junior college. So there's a lot of variables in it that people don't take into account, but we're going to spread our wings. And again, if there's 1,300 players in those eight conferences, why not try and get involved with them? Because again, if you steal one, you have a program changer on your hands. Okay. So a couple different things to dig into there. And, and you mentioned kind of the, the data and the statistics end of it from a uh, geographic standpoint, because it used to be when you guys first got here, you know, your staff was, was uh, Brock, Phil and Chris and Brock's from New York. He's obviously uh, no longer with you. Uh, Phil's from Philly and Chris is from, you know, the, the DMV area. And so you, you've got, and obviously you guys are in New England. So you've got basically the, the upper half of the East coast. Bryant had, uh, didn't necessarily have, have a brand. And I, I know from talking to you that that was, that was initially a goal was to expand kind of the, the branding of the program and the name recognition of the program. Uh, but so this is going to be a two part question, but since then, the offers or the geography with which the offers have have um, covered, uh, I think it's 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 almost like limitless now. You're big in like the West Coast these days. So the so take me through that the the geography behind the strategy, both initially and and what it's it's evolved into. Well, I think you hit it on the head. To start, it was Bryant is a regional school known in New England, um, not far out of New England. You know, I'm a New Yorker. A lot of people in New York didn't know Bryant, Philly, D.C., the areas that you just discussed. Bryant wasn't a name that people knew there. So our initial goal was let's get our name into the metropolitan area, to the Philly area, to the DMV area. And I think we did that in year one, kind of into year two. And then we've got taken a couple players, junior college transfers or four year transfers from other areas. And it's just you build relationships high school AAU coaches. And, you know, I've been doing this 19 years. Phil's been doing this 18 years. We both recruited for a long time and know a lot of people. And I think the thing that was a little bit different about this year where we were really able to spread our wings was during the pandemic. I mean, what are you doing? You're either on Zoom calls, you're watching clinics, doing clinics, reading, or you're recruiting. And for me, it was Let's try and spread our wings and build as many relationships as we can nationally and make this a national name. And, you know, on June 15th, we offered whatever they said it was, 136 players. Now, you can laugh and, it, and it's it, – I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but it's 136 players that if one of them committed, I would take them that day. Right. One okay. of those guys want to come. It's not a fake offer. Like there's people okay. talking about fake offers. One of those guys wants to commit, I'm taking their commitment that day. No, that might change. There might be 60 guys that, that will no longer have an offer if one of those guys commits because I'm recruiting specific positions, specific things in a certain class. I may only be taking a certain amount of high school kids in a certain class because, you know, I like recruiting transfers and junior college guys. So if a kid wants to come that day, great. If not, we'll continue to recruit you and evaluate you. But I want guys who want to be here as bad as I want you. So for me, there's that piece of, I want a kid who's coming to Bryant that's excited to come to Bryant. Right. So I read an article about uh, Cincinnati football coach Luke Vickle and his son committing to Cincinnati. And mm -hmm. the first time he committed, his son was like, yeah, I think I want to come to Cincinnati. And his dad was pissed. He wouldn't take the commitment. He's like, mm -hmm. nah, they didn't talk in the house for a week because he didn't like, he wanted his son to be passionate about coming there. Guys right. who are passionate about going to a school are usually successful where they go. Right. So for me, it's, Yes, we offered a lot of guys. We're going to build relationships, and we've already started to build relationships. Some of you, this is the right fit. But I tell all of them on the phone, I might not be the right fit for you with how hard I'm going to push you or how demanding I am. There's certain things. This has to be the right fit for both of us, and we're going to figure that out. But this scholarship doesn't mean you can have the scholarship offer for the next three years because I'm recruiting other guys. There's other guys at your position. There are transfers. There are junior college players. So this isn't a three-year offer. 
this is an offer. You want to come today? I want you today. And I'm going to continue to recruit you and continue to build an authentic relationship. But then you add into it the piece of if a kid doesn't come the first time around, there were, there's currently 1,017 players in the transfer portal this year. So you already have a relationship and a kid right. transfers and that relationship is already there, which has worked in my in our favor multiple times yeah. at Iona and, and at Bryant. Right. And then there's 200, 250 graduate transfers. So you could possibly recruit a kid three times. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not what it was 20 years ago when I was playing and you got recruited once, you went to a school, you were probably going to stay there for four years. Recruiting has changed. And I think we have to, as coaches, need to change and try and be as dynamic as we can possibly be. All right. So two things I want to dig into there. First first off, the um, and I'm going to come back to the, to the transfer uh, part of it. But initially, you said something which I think is also unique, is that... Um, you know, the offer isn't a standing offer because I think that's the biggest misconception. I had that last week. I went to a gym and, you know, coach is sending me a roster and he says to me, this kid's got an offer from Bryant. And I said, when was it? And he said, uh, and again, not everybody knows you and I are friends. So I get that. Oh, Brian's dying for him. I said, really? You want me to text Grass and find out? Um, you know, so there, so you get the, so Bryant offered him last, uh, last summer. So, in your model is you offer a guy it's if you want to come today we will take your commitment today but that offers and correct me if i'm i'm misinterpreting this but that offer is not necessarily on the table a year from now a month from now maybe even a week from now is that fair absolutely i mean it's it's you're going to get to know me i'm going to net get to know you and i'm going to recruit you hard with passion and you're going to understand what i'm about but i don't it's not my job to recruit you for 3 years my process is not necessarily the same as your process. Mm-hmm. Now, the guys I've stayed involved with, you know, we had a kid named Kai Kosmeyer signed with us this year. I was his first scholarship offer four years ago. I wanted him last year before he went to prep school. He ended up going to prep school, doing a postgraduate year. Yep. The pandemic comes, he can't take official visits. So in July, he ends up committing to us because he couldn't take official visits. He was most comfortable with me. So it was a long recruitment. But sometimes I'm not willing to recruit a guy for three years. Sure. I am what I am. We are what we are. We think it's a great situation, both academically, beautiful campus, great region, uh, and a program that we think is an up and coming program. And again, I want guys who want to be here and are not caught up in listing their offers. And that, that doesn't do anything for me. I want guys who want to be a part of what we do. Right. So that that's a really, I think, just to emphasize it again, not not for, for you or I, but for the coaches or kids listening, it's a really important distinction to understand that an offer is not, uh, you know, this tangible, tangible thing that lasts for an undefined period of time. It's it's a, if you commit now, we're willing that willing and ready to take it. But otherwise, it's it's not something that's that you just hold and, and can pull out whenever you want. Um, second part you mentioned is transfers. And just to, again, to provide a little context to the listener in, in coaching circles, you know, the term that's used is get them on the way back or, and, and essentially what that means is, is if a kid goes too high the first time around, or he goes to a, a level where he doesn't necessarily have the role he may want and he transfers down or, or whatever the case may be, uh, there's so many transfers, you, you, the level isn't necessarily important, but if he makes a, a move midway through his college career, he's already got that relationship from the first time he went through the process. You mentioned Iona um, and you mentioned Tim Kloos before that, but the, the, I mean, you were, Tim had a really unique uh, recruiting philosophy as a head coach and, and didn't frankly go out very often. And yet as his associate head coach, you were able to bring in a caliber of talent that was um, unprecedented relative to the rest of the league. And a lot of that was with with transfers. So talk to me about that specific process and and how you've you've seen that work firsthand. You know, when I when I went to work for Tim, um, one of the first things he said is I want older guys. I want junior college guys and I want transfers. So I was going to tap into my relationships and, and, and try and at that point get involved with obviously the junior college market. And when guys were leaving schools and it wasn't like it is now. So you could get a Momo Jones to come to Iona where if Momo Jones left Arizona right now, he'd have Kentucky and every yeah. blue program in the country, Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina. At that point it was us Seton Hall and St. John's and, and he wanted a, a, to make a major impact. So he chose us. Um, so that piece has changed a little bit, but I think in recruiting transfers, it's about relationships. A, 
I'll start recruiting guys on the front end that I know in their mind want to be higher level players. And I'm okay with that. Like, I don't, I'm not, listen, if you have, if you have a big East or ACC offer, chase it and take it. Like I tell guys all the time that I'm recruiting. If I was you, I'd take it. If when I was coming out of high school, if a Stanford was involved with me and then they stopped recruiting, if they offered, I would have gone to Stanford Hmm. and I would have chased it and chased my dream. So I never disparage a kid for chasing his dreams and want to play at the highest level. But in this day and age, obviously with the transfer portal being what it is, plus the graduate transfers, there's a large opportunity where a kid may end up moving on. And because you have a relationship with him and his high school coach and his AAU coach, and they trust you, which is the most important piece. And it's the reason we did what we did with transfers at Iona. It ended up being a lot of guys from the same coach or the same area. We got three or four kids from Newark. Mm -hmm. Scott Mercado helped recruit um, Mike Glover, who helped recruit Momo Jones. And then a lot of it's just based on your relationships and staying in touch with the AAU coaches and the high school coaches whose players you've had before. And if you treat their kids right and they have a good experience and they know you're honest and authentic, if their guys are looking for a different situation, at that point, they're going to want someone they trust. Usually Mm -hmm. a kid leaving a program for the most part because things didn't go the way he had planned, whatever it may be. And when he has a high school or AAU coach who has a trust in you and a belief in you, that second or third time around, they just want the right situation normally. And mm-hmm. it's usually pretty simple. Like it, it's recruiting transfers is a lot easier than recruiting guys in high school. There's all the mm-hmm. bells and whistles with high school kids. Transfers, you know, you know, I recruit a couple transfers this year who I want an opportunity to play. I want to get an education. I want to win. Uh, Coach such and such says you're the right guy. Let's build a relationship and see if this works. And two days later, they're committed. So it's just a different kind of recruitment. Usually it's a lot shorter, which for me, I'd rather recruit a guy for a week than recruit him for a year and not get him and spend all these resources traveling to see a kid play six, seven, eight times to him play the year out. And just because he got an Atlantic 10 offer, go to the Atlantic 10, which you see right. happen all the time these days. Right. Right. That's a, uh, you know, it's, you're basically articulating the conclusions in a study that, that Billy Donovan did back when he was at Florida. And because people forget that, that Florida was starting to be, um, prioritize transfers when he was he was still there and now obviously a lot of people are doing it but it was for exactly that reason for for an efficiency stand from an efficiency standpoint is especially as a head coach where you're pulled in a million different directions the allocation of time it takes to recruit and potentially get a a recruit on the transfer market it's such a a more compressed process than it is in the high school level so i think that makes a a, a lot of sense um so tell me about recruiting high school kids now what's your philosophy how many in an ideal world how many how many freshmen do you want on your team each year versus as you talk about you said tim liked and i remember this i saw it firsthand i heard him talk about it on several occasions he wanted older guys um you also at at iona because prior to becoming a head coach you had the reputation rightfully so as a as a great recruiter not just because of the Momo Jones and, and Scott Machado's and, and Chris Gaston's, um, but because of guys like AJ English, who didn't have a Division One scholarship offer, comes to Iona and ends up being tremendous. And I know there's a couple other stories like that. So take me through that part of it, how you find those those sleepers, and then talk to me about you know roster balance now and if that's a a uh, consideration for you. Well, like. For instance, this class was going to be a big class, so I wanted some older guys. You know, we return four guys, three played significant minutes, were starters, and I wanted to add some older pieces. So you add a Peter Kiss from Rutgers. You add a Melo Eggleston from Wake Forest, Arkansas State. You add a Luis Hurtado from UAB, and hopefully uh, you had a couple junior college kids. You had Luke Sutherland from Siena, the best team in the MAC, and hopefully a little older and more mature. But then you bring in three freshmen that you really like as well. And, you know, then I tell those guys all the time, now it's the best players are going to play. You know, mm. freshman, sophomore, junior, senior gets thrown out the window. If you look at our class last year, we brought in four freshmen, two of whom were on their all rookie team. You know, Charles Pride won Rookie of the Week four times. Mike Green was uh, Rookie of the Year. And those are two guys. I offered Charles Pride when I was assistant at Iona when everyone thought he was a Division II player. I was his first offer. You can just call me out by name. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I offered Mike Green when everyone thought he was a Division II or Division Three player. He's too small. He's too this. I mean, I went to see Mike Green in one workout and fell in love with him. Yeah. He won't play again, brought him up to visit, and it was done in two weeks. So for me, it's about 
a gut feeling about some of those under the radar guys. We're going to offer some higher level guys that yep. we're not supposed to get. But if you get them, great. And if not, if there's a second time around, there's a grad transfer, then they know your name and there's a relationship there. And they know Coach Grasso, the person, not Bryant just called. Yep. So I, mean, I think that kind of – with Peter Kiss, like, for instance, he's a guy who yeah. knew when he was in high school. I recruited him when he left uh, left Quinnipiac. And then when he was leaving Rutgers, there's a relationship there. So it's a lot easier to start that, here's what we're doing with Bryant, than just cold calling a kid and trying to explain your situation. When there's an authentic relationship there, which to me is the most important piece, I think you have a chance to get involved with some guys that may be higher level players. And I think we got – I like the transfers we brought in this year. But I'm always going to have a mixture of some older guys. But I also like those under the radar, no scholarship offers, people don't think you're good enough, chip on your shoulder guys because – I think those guys end up succeeding expectations when you get the right ones. You talk about Sed Casmir, AJ English, EJ Crawford. Um, you, you talk about uh, Charles Pride, Mike Green. You know, I've had a bunch of those guys. So I like a combination of the two. I want guys with a chip on their shoulder and either because they haven't gotten the respect they thought they deserved as high school players and they have something to prove, or they went to a higher level and didn't have the experience they wanted there and have something to prove. But I want guys with a chip on their shoulder and sign approved because that's been me my whole life. Well, and the other thing, and I, I know I'm not, I'm not asking you to give away the secret sauce here, but you have a great way of identifying what fits in your system. So whether it was, um, and, and I'm, I'm to reiterate, I'm not asking for the specifics of that, but I'm not sure AJ English, would AJ English have been AJ English if he went anywhere else? Or was it something specific about the way you and Tim developed players and then utilized them in that system that made him so good? Same with said Casimir. I, I still believe that, uh, you know, if said Casimir had gone to another Mac level school before the hip injury, he wouldn't have been very good. Now you look at that and say like, not as good, I shouldn't say very good, but not as good. Um, so I think a lot of that is, uh, you know, program specific, not just the way you play, but the way you develop guys and understanding who's going to be best in, in your, your style of play. So I think that, like I said, I know, I know you, you and not going to give up the secret sauce of, of what you specifically look for that says like, why is Mike Green going to be better than people think? Not just because he has a chip on his shoulder, but let's face it. There's a lot of kids who think they're better than they are. And a lot of kids have that chip on their shoulder, but there's a little something extra as you peel back the onion that allows them to get to that level. So the the commonality or the similarities between Mike Green and, and Cedric Casimir um, are pr pretty clear on the surface. But I also think there's my point being in a long winded way that there's an evaluation piece to that that I think goes goes under the surface, too. And. The other point I want to make is that from a recruiting standpoint, you know, everybody sees the offers, they see 500 offers and whatever it's been 20, you know, eight months or whatever. And they say, um, you know, that that gets watered down. It doesn't necessarily mean as much, but your talent level has never been watered down. Um, as you said, Charles Pride, he had commitment levels from let's just talk about the guys who committed out of high school. Charles Pride had offers as high as the, the A-10. Um, so you might get a Mike Green who's under the radar and undervalued and, and you show, you know, the ability to evaluate, but then you get guys who, who go to a higher level. And, and that's something you attribute to being their first offer. I think part of it is being their first offer and getting involved with guys early. And hey, listen, here's the funny thing. On June 15th, we offered 136 players. Yeah, that was brutal. You know, but do you know what else that did? We were talked about more that day than Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke. ESPN did a little thing on it. So that day we got more, our website got more hits than it did the whole month that day. So what you're getting is notoriety about your program. So now people look and say, wow, they went from three wins to 10 wins to 15 wins. They have this guy coming in, this guy coming in, this guy was rookie of the year. So you're trying to build a brand and build something that people want to be a part of. So it, there, there's a lot of pieces to it for me that yeah. I just believe go together that help your program in a lot of ways. You know, you're talking about during a pandemic, the marketing of what our recruiting did for our university, people yeah. were very happy about. So well, I was just, from an administration standpoint, right off the bat, I mean, you're talking about getting traffic to the university website and saving money in your recruiting budget. So those are, those are probably not the main reasons why you do it, 
But at the same time, it's something that, that you know, from an administrative standpoint, even if they don't realize what it's stemming from, they've got to be happy with those kind of uh, other contributing factors. Yeah, there's no question. I think it, it's it's multiple. There's multiple reasons behind it. And it's been effective for me. It's something I'm comfortable with. And I think at the end of the day, a lot more people in this country know Bryant University men's basketball than they did whatever 28 months ago, like you said. And that's what you're trying to do. And so if you offer a kid who's a, a high major minus player that ends up at a, at Mississippi State and his teammate sees, oh, Brian offered, you're watching the kid on video, you see one of his teammates, you end up liking one of his teammates. There's so many different variables that happen through this. But when your name is out there and there's a buzz about your program, I think it's a good thing for the university. I think it's a good thing for our program. And I think we've gotten more right than wrong, and you're never going to get them all right. right. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, a lot of this is guesswork. I mean, this year with the pandemic, you're guessing even more. But I'm comfortable with the guys we've brought in. I'm comfortable with the teams that I helped recruit at Iona. Um, so there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Um, not everyone has to agree with mine. But it's not something that I just decided, oh, I'm just going to offer all these guys. You know, there's a plan behind it. And there's it's something that's been discussed for hours and hours with different coaches, people I trust, my staff. So it's not it's not something I just decided I was going to do on a whim. No, that makes sense. And it, and it certainly provides a lot more, <clears throat> excuse me, of the, the philosophy behind it. Last question I have. You talked about the kid who transfers down to Mississippi State. You ever encountered the kid because you offer guys early. So have you ever encountered the kid who, who, you know, you, you, for example, you said you offered Kai Kosmeyer four years ago, uh, Kai Kosmeyer, and I know you said he's playing very well for you and you're pleased with him right now, but so let's take somebody else you offered four years earlier. Have you ever run into a situation where a kid comes back and says two years later, Hey, I want to take you up on that offer. And you have to say like, Hey, it's not on the board anymore. I know you said earlier in this interview that, you know, it's a, it's, it's specific to that point in time. But have you ever had to had those hard conversations with those players after the fact if they misinterpret the the kind of timing of it? Absolutely. I mean, it's part of the deal. And I've had to do that this year because we brought in different positions. You know, when you have a, a large class you're bringing in, we brought in some guys at different positions. So our roster looks different now. So there are guys we were recruiting a year ago that we can't take now. And that's part of the if you committed a year ago, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to fill that spot. I'm holding if, if you commit, I'm holding that spot for you. But the other variable to it is every year your roster is going to change. So if it's right. a rising junior and he wants to wait it out and see who gets involved his junior year, like most guys do, you know, it's where, you know, 10 years ago, I think guys were recruiting, a so uh, committing as sophomores and juniors. I think that's happening less and less. Yeah, um, agreed. So for that reason, most guys want to go through a process and mm -hmm. we're going to go through your process and we have to go through our process as well. And I explain that to people. I explain that to coaches and some people don't necessarily agree with it. But for me, again, you want to come when I offer you a scholarship, please come and please come here and be great. And but the other side to it is I'm also going to recruit other guys. And if it's a kid, it could be a kid in another class. It could be me taking a transfer mid year, whatever it may be. That changes the dynamic of your roster and that changes the way you're going and it, for anybody, that changes the way they're going. Yeah. I mean, right. people can, can try and pacify it however they want or talk through it however they want, but we all make adjustments and we all put offers out there that at times you can't hold up. Even if you only recruit six guys and offer six guys, there's going to be a kid you're going to offer that for whatever reason, your roster is going to change or you didn't evaluate your roster correctly and you don't need that same position. How many times do you see a team needs a two-guard, a two-guard, a two-guard, then in November, they realized I need a five man and all the two guards they offered and they're not recruiting anymore. Well, you've heard me say this, that the things that coaches bitch about not having, oop, I said bitch, uh, the, 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 uh, the things that coaches bitch about not having in, in January or February, almost never the things they prioritize in July because they get seduced by upside and, and potential and, you know, start stop looking for those intangible and culture pieces that that may have cost them some games. <laughs> Um, during the course of the, the season. But so I've, all right, we, we've drilled down on the recruiting on the recruiting enough, but I, I, I do want to ask, because this is a bit of a, a contrarian mindset. You talked about your dad, you talked about Tim. Um, what, before, before I let you go, what else does this contrarian mindset apply to in the way that you run your program? Because I've heard you 
you know, I sat in on a clinic you did uh, during the pandemic with local coaches and you were talking about um, different things that you're contemplating, just trying to think outside of the box. And I think so many of us across so many different industries and, and uh, you know, subsets of the population get caught up in, in subscribing to groupthink. And I know that's whether it's with your recruiting, uh, which you've certainly explained at this point, but what else do you kind of have those contrarian viewpoints about? I think just style of play stuff. And, and I study it a lot and talk about it a lot. I mean, Tim Kloos and I talk three, four times a day and we're always bouncing different ideas off each other because we're both so outside the box. But I mean, like for one, everyone's gone away from pressing. Why is that? Nobody presses anymore. Where when Rick Pitino was doing it at Providence, it turned into the fad, and everyone everyone wanted to be a pressing team. You know, I remember, is that because of fouls? Is that because of the way the game's officiated? You could press without fouling. Just make your guys not foul. I mean, and yeah. and that that there there's reasons behind all of it. Sure, sure. But to me, like the game changes so much, and then we all just follow and we're no, gonna do it's a copycat else. game. No doubt about it. Yeah, where everyone wants to, you know this. America's play is now the, you know, ball screen continuity, the flow that everyone wants to run because it's easy to run and everyone runs it. You know, it's, right. I, I think it is a copycat game and there's times you take things from everyone. And I'm definitely someone who does that and takes plays and I'm watching NBA games and drawing up sideline OBs and all that stuff. But I mean, I remember my dad 25 years ago talking about if he was a division one coach, he'd recruit 12 shooters. And I think me and you would discuss this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he thought, I remember he just used Boston University as the school he was talking about. I was like, well, I was the head coach of Boston University. I recruit 12 shooters, space the floor, and put all shooters on the floor all the time. Now everybody just wants to put shooters out. So I've been around people who've thought about things that were kind of ahead of the curve. And that's kind of what I'm always trying to be. And we may be a little different this year, pandemic year, less time to prepare. Teams are going to have less time to prepare. So we may use use and do some different things and some stuff I've thought about. But I, I just don't get caught up in this one set way to do it. And I don't get caught up just because it's done at the college level this way all the time that it's right. I mean, some of the best coaches I've ever been around are high school coaches. And some of the guys I really trust are high school coaches and Obviously, there's great coaches at all levels, but I just think we need to think outside the box a little more. And then you find what works for you. You know, I'm OK being a little different and taking a chance and taking some risks and being different and throwing it out there and seeing what happens. Some guys are more cookie cutter. I'm going to do it my way. This is my system. This is the way we're going to play. For me, it's about you put together the toughest, hardest working, most talented group of guys as you can. And then you try and make it fit with that group. Makes sense. Gross, appreciate you doing this. I know a lot of people uh, see the offers, they see the volume, they they make their jokes. I've certainly been guilty of that. Um, but I think that when you ex when you explain the methodology behind it, it it just it shows that there's it, you know it's not unlike quite frankly Tim's style of play that you guys played at, at Iona. People would see it and they'd say, oh well, they they just have players and they're just playing fast. And I'd always tell them like. Have you ever been to one of their practices? Do you know how hard it is or how much how much thought and coaching goes behind the way they're, they're playing? And I think you, you've kind of uh, brought a similar style to recruiting it, where at first glance, people may not appreciate um, the methodology or the strategy behind it. But I appreciate you uh, taking the time to explain it here. I know I texted you the other night and I led with serious question, dot, dot, dot. Would you be willing to come on the podcast and explain the re-, re uh, you know, the offer policy and let me make fun of you a little bit. So in all seriousness, I appreciate you doing it. Uh, most people who have contrarian opinions about things don't really want to explain them. They want to kind of keep that competitive advantage. Um, so I appreciate your your candor and, um, you know, kind of allowing us to understand the thought process behind the your recruiting philosophy. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Keep growing that beard. You look great. And I'm yeah, here, I told you you could make fun of me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here we go. <laughs> who wears the hair better? Who, who, uh, the beard is awful. I know it's, it's not good. It's not good. good. Beard, huh? <laughs> All right. That's Bryant head coach, Jared Grasso. And, uh, thank you one more time for joining the upside podcast. We'll be back with you next week.